question. This is the African Center for Study of the US, which is based at Wits University. Uh, and, and this is your host. Uh, the, the African Center for the Study of the US was established in March 2018. Uh, and since our launch, uh, only about slightly over two years ago, uh, we have rapidly grown to become one of the definitive, definitive hub for Africa generated knowledge and nuanced understanding of the US as a nation and a society. We do this through various um, approaches, but the key ones are one, we undertake research uh, and, and produce uh, research reports. We produce uh, journal articles. We produce commentaries and think pieces. We also do this through our academic program where we, various colleagues as associated with the center involved in the teaching of Africa-US relations. And we also do this through engagements of this nature. Public lectures, uh, now most of them virtual, where we pick issues and analyze them, uh, relying on our various experts who are research associates or friends of the center. And the elections, US elections 2020 project is one such. Uh, just a quick one that if you want to find some more information about the center, we are available on the Wits University we website and uh, there's uh, much more uh, detailed in, in, in information on what we do and how we go about doing what we do. Uh, just to mention also very quickly that we are supported and funded by the Ford Foundation, by the Hewlett Foundation, and by the US Embassy in South Africa. And we are in the motions of getting on board other supporters and other partners. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce the two eminent scholars who are going to help us launch this event. Eminent in the sense that uh, both gentlemen, you know, Professor John Stremlow and Professor Gilbert Kajagala have had a very major impact on the study of international relations and international politics more generally in South Africa, Africa, and globally. Uh, the, the person, the professor will start us off is John Stremlow, who is a honorary professor in the Department of International Relations at Wits University, having served as the department's founding director between 1998 and 2006. He was vice president for peace programs at the Carter Center between 2006 and 2015. Previously, he served as senior advisor to the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, uh, and that was based in Washington, D.C., between 1994 and 1998. Uh, he was deputy director for policy planning in the office of the U.S. Secretary of State, 1989, to 1994, and a strategic planning officer for World Bank uh, between 1988 and 1989. Uh, and, and before then, he was with Rockefeller Foundation in the 1970s to, to mid-1980s. Without further ado, I think I would like to invite uh, Professor John Strimro to kick us off. Then I'll introduce Professor Gilbert Kajagala uh, when, when this time comes. Uh, I think that it would be fair that way. Welcome, Professor Strimlo. Thanks very much, Bob. I appreciate the uh, introduction and the little biography because I approach uh, this assignment. I'm very glad to be asked to do this, but I approach it with great trepidation, Bob. Um, nothing in that career that you outlined, nothing in my IR training or graduate study has prepared me for analyzing the prospects of a US presidential election in the midst of a global pandemic, economic crisis that in the US has been compounded by the overdue national recognition among white Americans of the nation's simmering and subversive racial conflict. So we have three crises interspersed at the same time. Uh, my second point of trepidation is that I'm more confounded by the politics of the Trump administration than any other presidency in my lifetime, which dates back to the Harry Truman administration. Truman upset Dewey, as you may remember, in 1948 and famously declared 
the only reliable polls are the one conducted on election day. But with Donald Trump, I am not for the first, I'm for the first time not so sure that America can run a credible and timely election to facilitate the transfer peacefully of power, which has been doing since 1789. So this is a big deal. And that intimidates me. And then thirdly, the sustainability of this 231-year-old experiment in democracy is really at this unprecedented inflection point. The closest analogies I can draw professionally from this um, moment uh, comes at the time when I was in, in policy planning as deputy director, uh, 89 to 94. We had inflection points in the Soviet Union with the collapse of uh, that regime and with the collapse of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Attempts to consolidate liberal democracy have so far failed in Russia, but our, the struggle continues as we say down here in South Africa. And what, what really is at stake in this election is the future of liberal democracy, this election in the United States. That is my real source of trepidation and why I'm so glad that you're having this series. But I have to say that <laughs> I'd like to be able to predict, to predict events after they happen, Bob, uh, in, the, in the spirit of a good historian, not right now in forecasting. But I have tried to, in this brief introduction, come up with two kinds of scenarios that may inform our discussion going forward. The first is, who will win this election and by how much? The second question is really important, as it is in any election, how much? The second set of scenarios will deal with options that African governments might consider as they plan to engage the victor of the US election after January 20th, 2021. And I think Gilbert will be talking to some of these issues going forward. On the electoral scenarios, I see essentially three possibilities realistically. One is that Biden wins narrowly in the Electoral College, but gets a larger popular majority than Hillary Clinton did in 2016. So Biden winning narrowly in the Electoral College and then larger in the majority popular election. The second is that Biden wins the popular majority, but he loses in the Electoral College as did Hillary Clinton in 2016 and Trump therefore would claim that he has been elected for a second term. The third electoral scenario is that Biden wins and he wins big, including with a Senate majority. Now the key assumptions that I am working with in these scenarios are that first of all, Trump will try to steal the election by all means he thinks he can get away with, including undermining the integrity of the process, voter suppression, democracy suppression, I call it, use of militias, not committing to accepting the results, denigrating the legitimate or illegitimate criticism and analysis of, as fake news, uh, those kind of things we've seen for the last three and a half years. Second assumption is that COVID and the economic crisis have cut deeply into his support, deeply, including uh, among seniors, white middle class, mobilized Blacks and Hispanics who have suffered disproportionately under these two crises and youth. The third assumption is that Biden's big tent strategy is in fact working among normally fractious Democrats. This is a real turnaround for me because the Democrats have usually been the fractured ones and the Republicans united, but they're not this case now. The fourth assumption is that Biden owes his huge political debt to African-Americans um, and in gaining the nomination and that that uh, assumption will give uh, Africa a special claim on his presidency. Uh, the final assumption is that Biden cannot lose a credible election. That should be evident from my scenarios. The Economist, you know, which has now got a presidential uh, window for polling each week, puts Biden's uh, uh, chances of success in the popular vote at 99% and at 90% for the Electoral College. NBC News last night um, projected a Biden Electoral College win of 334 to 125. 
which would be a blowout and would likely bring the Senate with him. Um, I, I, I think it's too early to know whether that's true. And let's talk about that going forward on question and answers and the like about what could um, turn things around at this late date uh, for the November 3rd election. Uh, the scenarios for engaging uh, the new administration in 2021 and the implications for Africa, uh, I make certain assumptions. One, if, uh, if it is Trump, it'll be more of the same, although his neglect of Africa could be more malignant and the perpetuation of long-standing programs like PEPFAR or the African Growth and Opportunity Act, et cetera, which have benefited Africa could be trimmed. But if he keeps uh, Tibor Najan as Assistant Secretary, the U.S. embassies in Africa uh, will continue to function as they have, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, and uh, I really don't want to speculate on what the risks of changes are in those particular programs, because with Trump, you never know. Um, the second is that if Biden wins, a very different set of contingencies are possible. And I hope that this series that you're doing under the center's auspices will inform the planning in African governments and in civil society and university research centers for this contingency now. We know, we all know that liberal democracy is under a threat globally. You can take a look at Freedom House's 2020 survey and you know Freedom House was started in 1941 as a bipartisan project with a mission to counter US isolationism and fascism that was uh, of, of great concern in the world in those days. And it still continues, but its report, as you know, says that this is the 14th year of decline in liberal democracies internationally. Um, and here is its grim conclusion on the United States, which has fallen eight, eight uh, notches down in the 2020 report, uh, is becoming less, less democratic. That's behind countries like uh, uh, Greece uh, and, and other uh, uh, European and East European countries. Um, and, and, uh, and, and what they said in the conclusion was, uh, quote, the pressure on electoral integrity, judicial independence, safeguards against corruption, fierce rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetorical attacks on the press, the rule of law, other pillars of democracy coming from American leaders, including the president himself. So there are no secrets here. We were all forewarned, Bob, I hate to uh, remind everyone, by the great uh, uh, South African uh, uh, satirist Trevor Noah in 2016, who did a memorable segment comparing the attributes of Donald Trump to Idi Amin and to Rob Mugabe and to Muammar Gaddafi. Trump's tribalism does mimic African autocrats. And at the continental level, the African Union's Constitutive Act and the African Charter for Democracy Elections and Governance commits all members to have regular national elections subject to AU inspections, as you know. And a second Trump term would merely hearten the spirits of African autocrats, whereas Biden could provide some reassurance to African Democrats. That's at the core of my thinking about this. Uh, Biden will initially be swamped by undoing the domestic dem disasters and federal, the federal government's disruptions of uh, operations under the um, Trump administration. M my sense is politically, Africa will be a priority for several reasons. First of all, Biden's candidacy was saved by African American voters in South Carolina, specifically the distinguished representative James Claiborne, who's a senior um, a member of the, of the Congressional Democratic Caucus. I recently joined a, a Zoom with um, Representative Claiborne, and he noted that Biden's longstanding interest in African affairs, especially uh, South Africa. Um, I, I had a question for Susan Rice about um, South Africa reclaiming a strategic partnership, and she was very positive about that. I say that as an aside. More, more generally, the emphasis would be less in a Biden administration on security issues. The John Bolton uh, containment strategy that was the so-called Trump doctrine toward Africa is already history and would be even more buried under a Biden administration. There would be much more attention to democracy, human rights, economics, and trade. Um, 
in a, in a far more balanced way, non-zero sum, positive sum approach, um, and working multilaterally and bolstering African regional cooperation and sub-regional groups like the regional economic communities. The, the functional areas of public health and Feed the Future and Power Africa and YALI would all continue, of course. And some of these would continue, I think, under Trump's second administration, unless he suddenly woke up some morning and decided that uh, it was time to kill him. Um, the, the process to include governments, civil societies and universities, research institutes, arts and culture, business and labor. I sense from this meeting of the advisors on Africa that uh, Biden would take a much more inclusive view of Africa and US relations than has been to the conventional international relations in the past. Um, let me tick off in conclusion, uh, several substantive issues I think will be targets of opportunity for engaging a Biden administration um, in ways that would serve Africa's interests, uh, countries uh, individually and collectively um, but aspiring democracies, I should add, would be prioritized and containing China will not be prioritized. Uh, trying to persuade uh, and work with African partners to encourage the spread of democracy in Africa, which would be consistent with the African Union's principles, of course, um, would be, I think, a priority. Um, but my, 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 my hit list of, of, of quick topics some of which uh, this series may focus on, um, would start first and foremost with the obvious, public health cooperation. It's just scandalous that the CDC has been unhelpful to Africa in this moment of crisis around COVID. Um, it's the number one domestic concern for, for uh, leaders uh, uh, here and, and in the United States, of course. And I think they would quickly develop uh, links to restore the kind of cooperation in public health and the scientific community that we are so familiar with historically in the fight against Ebola or SARS or other um, uh, African diseases, and most importantly, um, uh, HIV uh, AIDS. Secondly, uh, and this might surprise you, but I think a very easy push, and Biden seems determined to do this, is to get voting rights and electoral reform underway, particularly voting rights bill that would be named for John R. Lewis, the recently deceased congressperson. Um, this is uh, something that I think is very much in tune with, with the African Charter and, and, and what my, I'm, I'm on the board of the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa, ISA, and ISA has an MOU with the uh, African Union. And in all of our countries, and particularly down here in South Africa, there's a big debate going on about the reform of um, the electoral system and improving representation and direct representation uh, and what kinds of formulas would work. And um, there has been in the US recently, in the last two or three weeks, released a new US bi uh, a bipartisan National Academy of Arts and Sciences report, reinventing American democracy for the 21st century. And it includes very pragmatic suggestions like rank voting, term limits for high court justices, kinds of things we have here under chapter nine institutions in South Africa campaign financing reform, nonpartisan restrict, uh, re redistricting procedures for the US. Um, US uh, voting rights have been undermined by the politicization of the Supreme Court in the United States. And I would see this bill of, uh, in, in honor of John Lewis, and particularly if the Senate turns democratic, pushed day one or day two of the Biden administration and if African leaders who are in support of having this be the foundation for building to Agenda 2063, for example, um, and the constituent, giving this constituent act more say on the principle of non-indifference of the internal affairs of member states, I think voting rights and electoral reform might be a very fertile ground for, for, for further study and, and, and research. The third topic, which also may surprise surprise you since it's so pervasive, um, is corruption. Uh, the, 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 the Trump administration is far and away the most corrupt uh, administration of my lifetime. And it's in, in ways very familiar to Africans. I mean, he's self-dealing all the time um, and, um, and, 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 and paying off friends. 
we call it oligarchy in, in service of state capture here. The minority party is the Republican Party, and he uses his powers to consolidate that, uh, that capture in, his, uh, in, in association with his base. So corruption will be under pressure, and, and, and Biden is going to be under pressure to, to, to deal with corruption in the Trump administration and cleaning up the US government and putting in inspector generals that, that Trump has gotten rid of or put his yes men in place there. It's a highly sensitive domestic issue. I understand that. But I think Africa and the United States might usefully strengthen the work that they've been doing on illicit financial flows, for example. Tabu and Becky chaired a very important commission for the African Union and the, and the Economic Commission for Africa that issued a follow-up report that's, that, I mean, that, that should have a follow-up report issued and, and worked on because what, what Mbeki's uh, and his colleagues concluded was of course that Africa loses more money through illicit financial flows, principally corporations who are hiding profits and sending them abroad or people that are stashing uh, illicit gains abroad uh, than it does in development assistance. And there is a, um, a, a procedure and a, and, a, and a working linkages that could be strengthened between research centers on things like illicit financial flows which would recapture tax dollars that are uh, tax funds that, that all governments need here on the continent. The fourth topic is the Biden plan for climate change and environmental justice. If anyone wants to get a, get a feeling for that, they should visit his, his uh, website. And, and you can see that um, he's gonna make climate change a very high priority. He says he will rejoin Paris Accord in day one. Of course, the United States has never actually left it because it wouldn't leave it unless there was a Biden, unless there was a Trump second term. It's not due to exit the the the, the as as Biden as uh, Trump has committed until June of, of next year. So um, I, I think that the climate change area is particularly ripe for U.S. Africa cooperation because Obama and Xi Jinping of China together committed to fund the Green Climate Fund, which is gonna benefit Africans primarily for mitigating the impact of climate change. Um, the Bolton Doctrine, as I said before, containing China is, I feel, gone. And on China-US or China-Africa relations, I think there's a great area of potential cooperation with the possible win-win-win. I don't deny that there is, is going to be, and Biden is, is gonna to have to respond to constituencies that are concerned about Chinese interference, Chinese uh, stealing of intellectual property rights, Chinese perhaps interference in the election, although it won't be like uh, Russia's or maybe even Iran's. But still, there's a lot of issues that divide the two countries, but this is not a new Cold War, and Africa should be a theater for win-win-win. I worked on this issue a lot when I was at the Carter Center. We had Ambassador Zhang from China and Ambassador Princeton Lyman, who's now deceased, working together with um, uh, African diplomats. And it, the Chinese made it plain that if the Africans would drive the agenda, they would be amenable to working with the US and, and uh, Africa together. And that has already happened on the Horn of Africa on maritime security issues, and to some extent in the public health area, but a lot more could be done. So that's a fifth topic. A sixth topic is reform and strengthening of multilateral institutions. Um, starting with the WHO. I mean, it's outrageous and scandalous that the, China, that the Trump administration in a pandemic would try to pull the US out of the WHO. Um, and and if, if there's a second term, then I think Africans would have to ignore the US and just try to work out partnerships with other countries. But if the Biden administration comes in, then there would be a lot of support for uh, reforming the WHO in a deliberative process involving all stakeholders, reforming the other aspects of international institutions like the GATT, possibly even in some day the, I never thought I'd live so long, so I won't say this, uh, the UN Security Council. But there will be a lot of support for multilateralism, and I think that is worth pondering how Africans can get their agenda before the Biden administration sooner rather than later. Seventh is security issues will be downplayed, but still important. And there are these new areas of cyber and disinformation, which I very complicated and I won't go into right now, but we can talk about later if you want. And number eight is economic revival for, for the, the huge area, but reviving jobs and businesses. Biden's policy papers 
are a rich source of insights and information about this. If anyone wants to take a look at it in the conjunction with the series that you're doing here, Build Back Better is a very appealing and often general idea that is still going to have to be fleshed out under enormous budgetary stresses, we know. The task forces could be established on aspects of this that Africans would get their agency and, and, and agenda before them and into the Black Caucus in ways that might be politically um, uh, leveraged. Finally, um, arts and culture, which have been so critical to the freedom struggles in the United States, South Africa, and across Africa, uh, will continue no matter what, Trump or Biden, but I think they should be celebrated and worked on as part of a revival of uh, the US as a responsible stakeholder if that comes to pass in this election. Let me end by putting in a positive word um, on Donald Trump and suggest an article some who are listening to this um, uh, webinar might wish to read ahead of next week's discussion by Francis Cornegay and Brooke Spector on the, on the history of relations. In the September issue that's just uh, going to hit the stands and it's already online, the Atlantic uh, magazine has a long article by Ibram K. Kendi uh, that has a great and substantial um, argument. Uh, its title is, Is This the Beginning of the End of Racism in America? Kendi argues that, quote, we are living in the midst of an anti-racist revolution. Trump held up a mirror to American society and reflected back a grotesque image many had hitherto refused to see. George Floyd obviously was a catalyst in this. Uh, the impact of, of uh, the differential impact of COVID and economic crisis were too. The details of this history and the complicity of the, the, of the Republicans post civil rights legislation in the six, in, in 65 um, really do um, point to the possibility now of a democratic sweep in 2020. This is being compared to the 1932 sweep that Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, undertook in 1932 and that led to the New Deal. If so, Trump deserves credit along with COVID for providing the catalytic force for this change. But unlike the New Deal, with its accommodation of the Democratic-led South, segregationists that excluded African Americans, and by extension now Africa, from the benefits of a new New Deal, in Biden's new New Deal, that would be inclusive. America's vision, perhaps, of a sort of overdue Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which it's never had, the, the, the Republican Party, in my view, needs to, needs to destroy itself. This happens to political parties in the U.S. historically over the years. They change, and Brooks and, and uh, Francis can talk about that next week. But where Trump has been positive for us, it's been to be a precipitant for this, which is good for American democracy, and I think ultimately could be good for African democracy as well. Why don't I end there, since it's now 3.30, and turn it over to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, uh, the eminent uh, Gilbert Kiliagala. <laughs> and uh, he can uh, pick up and I, we can come back on questions if you have any, but thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Professor Stremlo. And um, yeah, I think we've made some uh, quite interesting, uh, very well structured uh, observations. And we'll come back to that. I think one of the questions I do have for you, even, even as we shift to Gilbert, <laughs> will be help our audience on the African continent to understand why we will even contemplate a Trump win at all. Uh, because from um, an African point of view, at least based on the views we get from African audiences, be they on social media or mainstream media, they, they just don't understand how... 
breaking up, Bob, but I understand your question. I, I can get your question, and, and it's a very good one. And, um, um, we, to start with. So perhaps when you come back, um, do you want to respond uh, quickly? Then we can move to Gilbert. Yeah. Great, just a very quick one because it's 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 very timely and it's important and I didn't stress it enough in my talk. What I'm most worried about is a is a constitutional crisis in the United States because, as I said at the outset, Trump will try to steal this election. And if it happens to be a close election, and there could be a surprise, Biden could stumble or get sick. You could have um, a, a sudden vaccine. I don't think so. But uh, an economic downturn seems unlikely. I mean, upturn seems unlikely. But nevertheless, it could be fairly close. And then you could have a crisis. If, if he won, if, if Trump was to win again in the Electoral College, but not the popular vote, I don't think that the mobilized uh, progressives who were so evident in the 2018 uh, congressional election would put up with it. And I don't know how that would get resolved. So. In the election business that I used to do with the Carter Center, we always hated close elections. I can see it being close. Um, you have to have that contingency. I thought Hillary Clinton was gonna win by a mile in 16, and I said so on the eve of the election, and I was wrong. So I'm sobered by that. All right, thanks. I think now let's, uh, we'll, uh, for, for colleagues who are participating in this, and I hope I'm not breaking up now, uh, I'll try to speak as close to the computer as I can. Um, kindly, uh, you know, put aside your question, uh, hold your question in mind uh, for, for John, and when we come back to the discussion session, then you can post those questions. We also have the facility within uh, Zoom, which is the question and answer box. You can actually write your question there, or indeed in the Zoom webinar chat box, and then we'll come back to those uh, questions. Uh, and, and, and John will respond appropriately. Uh, but for now, I think we want to move on to Gilbert. And uh, Gilbert Katyagala is a young smart professor of international relations, and indeed the director of the Center, uh, African Center for the Study of the United States. Uh, he is the immediate former director at um, uh, the International Relations Department at Wits University and is an accomplished um, scholar in the particular in the area of uh, peace and security uh, fields. He holds a, a doctorate from um, uh, the Paul Nitz School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC, and is the recent editor of, among others, of War and Peace in Africa's Great Lakes Region, a Palgrave Macmillan book of 2017. Um, and is the author as well of Regional Cooperation on Democratization and Conflict Management. And one can go on and on, uh, you know, for, 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 for continuously for almost for an hour plus, I should say. Uh, but I want to stop here so that Gilbert can then make the presentation. And uh, those interested in uh, his works, all you need to do is Google him up and you will confirm this. Welcome, Gilbert. Thank you, Bob, uh, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the participants for making it on a Friday afternoon, uh, maybe a Friday morning in the States if we have participants from there. I also want to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, uh, John, who's presented uh, uh, an excellent overview of the, the bigger issues that this uh, series is going to address as we keep going. As Bob mentioned from the beginning, I think this is just a beginning of a set of conversations uh, around the US elections uh, this year. And I think this is a very momentous year, uh, the year of COVID-19, the year of Black Lives Matter. And we just learned recently that uh, this is also the year of uh, Zimbabwean Lives Matter. So it's an interesting period really to be talking about the US and Africa. My remarks are focused on uh, the meaning of US elections for Africa. And I think the question I'm asking here is what is Africa's interest in US elections? Uh, secondly, that question is going to allow me therefore to speak very briefly 
about U.S. foreign policy towards Africa. And I think what I want to do is to cast it in a, in a broader context of uh, what has the U.S. been doing in Africa over the years. I think that would be a good way to get to the discussion about why the U.S. is important or, or the meaning of the U.S. in Africa. So my basic argument, therefore, is that while every four years, African publics are attracted to U.S. electoral processes, and that while U.S. elections heighten expectations about the profound changes in U.S.-Africa relations, these expectations to me are often false. They are based on false assumptions about the workings of the U.S., particularly U.S. foreign policy to Africa. So that's my bigger point. Secondly, my argument is that there is remarkable continuity in U.S.-Africa relations over the years, particularly since the 90s. This is the kind of continuity, therefore, that transcends U.S. electoral cycles. In fact, the argument is that it defies, the continuity defies U.S. electoral cycles. It is therefore important to understand what these patterns of continuity are in order for us to appreciate the discussion around why the U.S. elections matter or they don't matter. Thirdly, and this is my final point, I'm going to argue that Africa should temper its expectations about any changes in U.S. policy, even under a Biden administration. And here I disagree uh, profoundly with John's uh, 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 basic thesis, but we can take up this during the discussion. So the point is that uh, we should temper our expectations about fundamental changes under a Biden administration, or even under a new Trump, uh, a new Trump admin, a second Trump administration. Why then are African? Uh, why then are U.S. elections interesting to Africa? There are two points that I want to put across. The first one is what I want to call political theater. U.S. elections are global events. And the theatrical component of these elections can always never be underestimated. I think from the conventions, to the campaigns, to the presidential debates, until the very end, the elections, there is often a sense of what I'm calling political drama that is unrivaled globally. I think it's because we are able to participate as a global community, as a global society in those elections. Uh, that's a, an interesting component. I think this year, because of the pandemic, we are, not, we are going to be deprived of the theater around the conventions. Uh, I think the conventions are going to be online. And uh, it's not fun, actually, to, to work the convention online. It's unlike the previous periods where we could enjoy the discussions and the, the parades. So the theatrical component, I think, is important. It's very fascinating. I think in Africa, the presidential debates uh, are of significance. Uh, because I'm arguing here that uh, the presidential debates often produce what I call a, a socialization impact, a political learning component to some of our, our countries. And I, I know from experience in East Africa, Kenya and Uganda, there is always pressure during elections for those countries to have televised, televised presidential debates along the lines of the U.S. presidency. And it's an interesting component, therefore, that uh, the presidential debates are attractive here 
uh, because everybody thinks, you know, this is how you should run our democracy. This is how we should see our candidates. We should ask them to explain what they are going to do. Uh, and I'm sure there are similar pressures in other countries across Africa, probably across the world, uh, for countries to begin to emulate uh, the presidential uh, debates that are, as I, I call them, a political spectacle that is of significance. And maybe this is a good area of research for an MA or a PhD student. What does the presidential elections mean for the rest of the world? And what does it tell us? It will be an interesting issue to debate. The second interesting question about the meaning of US elections to Africa has to do with what I'm calling the tremendous expectations about the man in the White House. There have not been any women yet, uh, but there is uh, uh, a whole set of expectations within Africa around who is going to be in the White House after the election. And these expectations are actually centered around other questions such as, is Africa going to get more goodies uh, after the elections? Are we going to see more presidential visits uh, after the election? A whole set of expectations that I'll try to debunk as I keep going. This perception, therefore, around expectations is very consistent with the studies of US foreign policy towards Africa, particularly in the 90s, that tended to argue uh, that democratic presidents were more amenable and more, more sympathetic than Republican presidents around African concerns, African aspirations, uh, and African interests. So that's really the popular, uh, in fact, scholarly description of, uh, of US-Africa relations that, and, and, and John has alluded to that, I think, in his presentation. Uh, that uh, Africans tend to vote with their hearts for democratic candidates uh, in the United States. And there are good explanations for why these perceptions persist. I think the first one is during the Cold War where you had the Republican presidents leaning mostly towards, you know, minority regimes in Africa. And uh, we talk about Reagan and so on the perception that Republicans tended to be more favorable uh, towards uh, minority re oppressive regimes in Africa. So that's what uh, I think fed that kind of perception of Democrats as the best guys for Africa in the White House. The second argument, and has been alluded to also by uh, John, is that it feeds into the domestic politics of the US where African-Americans for the most part, tend to support democratic administrations. So whenever there is, in fact, a Democrat in the White House, the more expectations within Africa about uh, why it is important to have uh, an African, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a democratic candidate because he was voted in precisely by the African-American community. In fact, this year is going to be important because uh, with the globalization of the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd phenomenon, uh, it is going to deepen that sense of whoever is elected, uh, particularly if, if the African Americans participate more clearly in the next elections, we'll have to see whether in fact uh, uh, a Democrat or Biden would make a big difference as John, I think that's John's uh, thesis. What I'm trying to argue here, however, is that over the years, this received wisdom about uh, Democrats being more favorable to African interests and Republicans being less favorable is not particularly accurate. And we've seen this over the years uh, as some Republicans through their deeds, and we talk about George Bush here, one, and George Bush two, doing more profound things around Africa-US relations than in fact the expectations around Clinton or Barack Obama. 
uh, the criticisms around Barack Obama, for instance, have always centered about he should have done more because he's a Democrat. He should have done more because he's, got, uh, he's of African ancestry. So the, the point here is that uh, I, I think the distinction between Democrats and Republicans making a difference on African issues, I think it ten, tends to be oversold. Uh, and this is why I was saying we should temper our expectations about the significance of these, uh, of these elections. This is therefore uh, why I come back to my point about we should uh, disabuse ourselves of the expectation that there will be profound changes in US-Africa relations, even with the coming elections. And that's, that's, that's my thesis here. Why do I say this? What then are the key parameters of US foreign policy to Africa uh, over the years? Uh, I think that's the most important element of what kinds of parameters, what kinds of priorities have been on the US foreign policy horizon towards Africa over the last 20 years or so. And so I want to argue that since the Clinton administration in the early 90s, US Africa policy has revolved around four uh, core priorities. I'll add another two, but uh, I'll come back to explain why those other two are important. But I, I should emphasize the four, which are one, U.S. contribution to building African capacity to manage conflicts. The security assistance has been a big theme in U.S.-Africa relations since the Clinton administration. We're looking at, uh, under Clinton, the African Crisis Response Initiative through Bush and Obama in the war on terror is just a simple uh, iteration on the bigger theme about how can the United States contribute to a peaceful and a secure Africa. And this is a theme that I am arguing has remained very constant. Uh, and it's not going to change very much. I mean, we may, dis we may debate about the money, but the, the issue is around how does the US contribute to African security? The second element, and John has alluded to, since the 90s, the democracy promotion as a major component of US-Africa policy. And we saw this from Clinton, uh, we've seen this through Bush, through Obama, how do we, how does the United States contribute to better and democratic governance in Africa? And more recently, I think if you just read the statements by people like uh, Naj, they're talking about how can the US in fact contribute to democratization in the DRC, in the Sudan? These are things that have been with us uh, uh, since, since the 90s. Uh, electoral systems as a core component of US engagement. Thirdly, economic engagement has been important and it has taken various dimensions. And think under Clinton administration, he described it as uh, the US contribution to Africa's re-engagement with the global community. And that was the theme in the, six, in the 90s. And that theme, that theme hasn't changed much. There are variations to that engagement. We have a Goa under Clinton, 20 years this year will be 20, we are celebrating 20 years of a Goa. Uh, then we had um, uh, people like uh, Clint, uh, 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 Obama coming up with Prosper Africa. We had Bush coming up with uh, Millennium Challenge account. And all these are variations to how can the US contribute to Africa's economic development. And there are new initiatives now under the Trump administration on the private sector engagement, Prosper Africa. These to me are not very, very new themes. They are bigger themes around an old debate about the US can in fact contribute to Africa's uh, uh, economic, uh, economic development. Fourthly, is the issue that John also has alluded to, the health. Uh, and I think it was best demonstrated with the PEPFA program 
under Bush II, which has been important in uh, US-Africa engagement. Uh, we see the health policy also being captured uh, in the donation of a thousand ventilators to South Africa, I mean, uh, under, under COVID. And John is correct that there are problems with the COVID policy. But I think uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, when he was, uh, I think, uh, this early this year, he was talking about maybe about 270,000, 270 million announcing toward a few African countries on, on COVID issues. We can debate the WHO issues, but I'm just saying health has remained a very important element in US Africa policy that is not going to change very much, not going to change significantly. The other two priorities uh, that have emerged more recently uh, because of the changing demographics in Africa, but also the global changes in geopolitics. So that's why the fifth priority is the youthful Obama coming up with a youth policy. Uh, I think from the Ghana speech that Obama gave on talking about leadership and institutions in Africa, but the importance of youth, the US engaging young people to build that capacity. And this is what has given us policies such as YALI and uh, uh, the, the new engagement with uh, Africa's future. And I think that is the, the point around it. Uh, the other policy that has come out more recently is the policy around China. Uh, how to engage, how the US is going to engage with the China threat. And this is not uh, uh, very new. It started with Obama uh, talking about uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton talking about the problems of China in Africa. Although it was very clearly uh, highlighted, I think, through what uh, John has already mentioned. John Bolton's uh, uh, speech ar around uh, the Africa strategy in December 8, 2018 clearly uh, brought up China to the focus. But it's pretty much a policy that he inher they inherited from uh, the, Obama, the Obama administration. So as I conclude, therefore, let me ask the question. If there is continuity, in US-Africa relations. What is the explanation for this continuity? The first explanation to continuity is of course the cynical argument, which comes out of a lot of the discussions in the US about Africa doesn't matter. Africa is not important. It's of significant irrelevance to the United States. I don't actually agree with that, that point. I think Africa has always mattered to the US because uh, there is a huge constituency of African Americans in, Af in, in the US. But I also don't think it's a good argument because what changes really, uh, the, 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 the Africa remains a global player. <laughs> and however much you want to, uh, uh, to uh, not focus too much on it, the US has to take uh, interest in what is happening in Africa, because Africa is a global player. The issue, however, is that the importance of Africa ebbs and flows uh, with changes that are very global, with changes that sometimes are not very African. So I, I, I don't really believe in the argument that Africa is not significant. And that's why there is continuity. I think the most accurate explanation for continuity is congressional bipartisanship on Africa, on core African issues. There has been a lot of continuity because Congress, as a significant institution in US foreign policy, has generally agreed on what I'm calling the major planks of US engagement with Africa. Whether we are talking about health, whether we are talking about security, these have remained issues that, in fact, Congress as an actor uh, takes uh, seriously. And we've seen this more recently, even under Trump, where Congress has been fighting the Trump's administration's attempt to limit uh, foreign, uh, foreign aid, foreign assistance. We've seen this in the 
congressional uh, fights to limit the, the military, military disengagement that the Trump administration has been proposing on the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. So that there is a lot of skepticism within some congressional uh, leadership that in fact, these, issue, these, these things should stay on board, uh, even though Trump wants to cut them. So, and, I'm, 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 and I think I'm, I'm, I'm making the point therefore that, that that bipartisanship has been critical in the continuity of US posture towards Africa. And I think we are going to see this very soon, I think over Africa, Africa is moving from Germany. I don't know where it's going next, but the congressional bipartisanship is important uh, to, uh, to US foreign policy towards Africa. Finally, I think there is more continuity because bureaucratic institutions such as the embassies uh, play their creative uh, roles in making sure that some of these major platforms actually remain, remain on board. So I'm arguing that uh, these institutions have agency and creativity around US-Africa policy. And, uh, and they are therefore guaranteed, or at least maintain that the US policy towards Africa doesn't change, uh, doesn't change very much. So yes, Trump has taken limited interest in Africa and has said some negative things about the continent. As he has said many other negative things about other people and other places. But my point is, this poster has not had a critical difference on the substance of US-Africa engagement. And this is my big disagreement uh, with John. My final point therefore is, because of Africa's dangerous fixation with big man politics, we tend to focus too much on who is going to occupy that seat at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And we lose sight therefore of the other key players uh, who are the main constituencies uh, towards the African foreign policy, uh, uh, US policy towards Africa. And therefore, as for this year's elections, I think we should watch and uh, hopefully see what the kind of uh, changes are going to come up. But my bigger point is that I don't really see that affecting Africa significantly. And uh, Bob, I think I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you, Gilbert. And um, uh, that is, uh, you ended on a very high note there. It's only fair that we go back to John because I think uh, you uh, essentially said that uh, whoever occupies uh, that position uh, is, doesn't matter in a, a, a big deal on the continent. And I, I think I was also very amused by <laughs> the point you made that uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, Democrat uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't quite uh, uh, matter. And in fact, you seem to suggest that in some instances, Republican presidents have done much better for the continent than uh, Democrats. Uh, pointing to evidence to that end. So I, I think before you go to, you know, a, a question posed by one of the attendees, let me ask John to perhaps uh, respond uh, in a sense. Well, thanks, thanks, Bob, and, and thanks, Gilbert. Uh, you, you framed it in a way that, which does give us an argument, and we do have an argument here and a difference of view, I think. The irony in my situation is that I would agree with you uh, completely about the bipartisanship and that the programs continue and they have momentum and that credit is given for PEPFAR to, to Bush, Bush the second and uh, Agoa to Clinton. <clears throat> this is at an inflection point in the United States, however, and I'm really surprised, and maybe not so, that you haven't focused more on what is the gut issue the real gut issue. The late great Kenyan political scientist Ali Masri once said to me that the first two global nations were, were 
South Africa and the United States. <clears throat> I, I think he was wrong. I think it may be South Africa, but that's a work in progress. America has been an ethnic state, but we've never had a white president until, as Tanishi Coates calls him, Donald Trump. <clears throat> This is the 13th, three, 300th anniversary, at least if you buy the New York Times dating of it, the 1619 or in the second year of the, the fourth century, um, the slaves were introduced to the United States. You know and I know that slavery and its sediments in the bloodstream of the continent of, 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 the, of America run very, very deep. For the first time in my lifetime, the implicit racial conflict contract, which keeps housing segregated, educational opportunities segregated, uh, jobs segregated, healthcare segregated, in practical ways, the infrastructure of racism in America. Um, we can say that the founders in their bargain on states' rights, the US was created more like a regional economic community in Africa today, after all, it was a states' rights constitution, not a human rights constitution like South African constitution was supporting ethnic nationalism. But we never had an ethnic nationalist as explicit as Donald Trump is at a time when the country is now sensitive to the fact that if it's going to be a civic nationalist democracy, a liberal democracy, it has to, in the South African terms, be a country that belongs to all who live there, united in its diversity. <laughs> and if we have in fact been punishing our ancestors, because modern genetics tells us we all come from Africa. The crime against humanity of racism in America is probably up there with as bad a crimes as anyone in the world has known. And Americans are suddenly dawning on this. I was raised with the lost cause mentality about the South, the accommodations that Franklin Roosevelt did with the Southern oligarchs to exclude blacks from the New Deal. This is all new awareness in America. Business will never be again as usual if Donald Trump is given a second term. Business might become more civilized and more civic nationalist if Biden gets elected. Leaders do matter. And the uh, deficiencies in American democracy, as you must know as an American, um, are rooted in things like the Electoral College. What's the Electoral College? It's to weight those smaller states. And in the case of the South, giving blacks three fifths of a person so that they could get their constitutional numbers up in the Senate so they could prevent integration. What was the, you know, I, next week you'll probably talk about the election of, of, of 1876 which was um, a very, very close one. And what the bargain was, once again, was to sell out um, African Americans in, in part of getting a reunion and getting the, getting the reconstruction ended in the South after the Civil War. We go on and on and on. These revelations to me in, the, in my lifetime, I'm 76, the first time Americans have been debating what it means to have a society which has structural racism embedded in it. This is not to say that we're going to get fair housing and we're going to get fair access to education overnight. But if Africans are going to be part of that conversation, then the kind of discussion which has gone on at the African Union to try to make sure that African states are more civil nas civic nationalist than ethnic nationalist, less tribalistic, I do not talk to people born in Kenya about this, um, that's a big deal. And I think that the possibility of doing that would make the uh, conventional way of thinking about Africa-US relations very different, profoundly different. But it's early innings now. That's why my trepidation about even having this conversation. And yet, and yet, uh, I, have to, I have to agree that there is a, 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 a revolution of anti-racism going on in the United States that I never thought I'd live to see. And in part, it's because Obama. There was a backlash to Obama and, and, uh, and, and whites wanted to make, uh, the Trump base wanted to make America great again for white Americans. 
This is all about race. And, and I, my wife contends me I'm, I'm too unicausal, but maybe it's by living in South Africa, I see it this way. But you know what tribalism is. I now know what tribalism is. America's never had a tribal president before, at least it was explicit, you know, um, as, as, uh, as Trump is. Um, Andrew Jackson was, but um, in his own way. But um, anyway, that, that's the, the difference I think between us. I think we're at a junk, this juncture and um, uh, the programs will go on, but the programs aren't really interesting. What I wanna know is, is America going to see Africa in a different light by virtue of seeing African Americans in a different light? I don't know, but I think there is something going on in American society, which is a hinge point in the history of the nation. And that will redound internationally in ways that we can only begin to discern. We may not be able to overcome COVID. So, uh, you know, there, and, and the economic recession and depression that occurs from that. I don't know, but it is about race. Thanks, I think uh, this is really the essence of debate that um, we, 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 we can uh, reach agreement on disagreement. Uh, but but um, I know that this is an interesting um, point of uh, departure as it were. But there's a, a colleague here who has posed a question. Can you, I hope you hear me, can you talk a little bit more about how the U.S. plans to contribute to Af Africans in economic terms? Um, and will the U.S. be able to provide the resources? I think this is a, a colleague who is posing that question. Maybe let me just repeat it very quickly. Can you talk a little bit more about how the U.S. plans to contribute to Africans economically? I think let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and I think let's start with Gilbert, then come to John. Yeah. Uh, but before I answer that, can I just respond quickly to uh, uh, John? Uh, by all means, uh, by all uh, means. John, my point is that um, I, I agree with you that there are really profound issues of polarization in the U.S. Uh, and these uh, issues have been exacerbated. Uh, the race issues have been exacerbated under the, under the Trump administration. My point, however, is that I, I, I don't know how Africa uh, reacts or responds ultimately to the kind of uh, polarized U.S. that we see today. So I, I, I buy the argument uh, that if there was less polarization, if Black Lives Matter, it improves the general posture of the United States to Africa, the more authority that the U.S. has to add uh, African issues. Because, so that's an important element. My disagreement, however, is Africans are not voters in U.S. elections <laughs> as a continent. Uh, we, have, we have aspirations, uh, and I'm saying some of those aspirations are, are correct, but then again, some of those aspirations are not, uh, because ultimately, the government that comes into power will have to make its uh, policies towards Africa as it sees fit. So the moral issues are profound. Uh, it would be nice to have a society where race is not significant. Uh, and in fact, we are grappling with those issues even here in Africa or in South Africa. Uh, so there, there are significant issues of foreign policy, the kind of moral authority uh, that we need uh, countries, for instance, the U.S. should stand up for those kinds of uh, universal principles of equality and so on. So that's, I, I totally agree with that, with that position. Yeah, I was only being skeptical about uh, whether the new person in the White House is going to make a fundamental change in terms of what have been, in fact, some of the key policies that the U.S. has had over the years despite my reservations about uh, the kind of leadership that we would expect from the U.S. at this time, at this point in time. On the question of uh, uh, 
Can you talk a little bit more about how the U.S. plans to contribute to our African economic growth? And my uh, response is also very simple. There are platforms, there are programs that have been in place uh, for U.S. contribution to Africa's economic growth. Uh, there are new measures under the, the Trump administration uh, encouraging uh, private sector, private actors to be more engaged. Uh, there is new emphasis on, um, on, uh, on, on economic development rather than foreign aid. And so, so these, these, these uh, platforms have, have not changed very much. They haven't changed very much. So I would not want to put too much money uh, in, in these kinds of programs, because as I said, uh, they have been with us. Uh, African countries are engaging the U.S. Uh, in terms of investment. There are many programs. Uh, so I don't really know whether they are going to make fundamental difference ultimately in uh, Africa's economic future. But if you read the program, they say, yeah, this is what we want to do. So let's hold the African countries uh, at, to their, to their uh, aspirations about economic growth and how the U.S. can engage them. Uh, in, in, that, in that big platform of uh, e economic uh, empowerment for their people. Thanks, Gilbert. I think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, let me just come back again to John. Um, and um, I think this is uh, the point of discussion here, uh, being that uh, in the recent past, we have in fact seen some African leaders actually take some very critical stances vis-a-vis -vis Trump. I think we saw that during this whole COVID, uh, in the earlier phases of uh, COVID-19, when um, there was a difference with WHO, whose director is, uh, of course, uh, Ethiopian. And when the US pulled out a number of countries, you know, Paul Kagame specifically, uh, and I think the president of Ethiopia or something, uh, came out very openly to criticize uh, Trump you know, in, in, in very open terms. And earlier, I think 2017 or 2018, when there was the talk of, uh, and excuse my language here, but I think that the language was the shithole shit country. Uh, and again, we saw the president of Ghana, uh, specifically if I remember well, coming out to be take a, a directly critical stance against Trump. Uh, in around the same period, 2017, there was an altercation between um, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa and uh, Donald Trump again. In, to my mind, these are some very in, you know, interesting developments because we haven't seen that kind of very explicit altercation or difference of opinion in the open between African leaders and America. Obviously, there's been criticism of uh, U.S., uh, leaders in the past, but not in very direct confrontational uh, ways. So I, I just wanted uh, John perhaps to speak to that, and then maybe Gilbert can also speak to that. I mean, does this dem demonstrate that uh, we, we are actually losing even levels of respect for each other at that leadership level? Um, sure, Bob. The, you know, the, the, the world is changing, and the U.S. was declining, relatively speaking, with the rise of the rest. Uh, long before Donald Trump. Um, the, the question right now, though, is who is the United States? And uh, the, the kind of programs that, that Gilbert's referring to have got their own bureaucratic momentum. They will be clipped or not clipped, depending upon the budgeting constraints and the personalities involved in the leadership of the, of the White House. But what I'm talking about in normal times, that is to say, what I'm talking about is this is this uh, this this juncture, and if it were to come to pass <clears throat> that uh, Biden was to win big and get the Senate, he'd have like Obama had for the first two years of his administration before the polarization reasserted itself, uh, an opportunity to make some big, really big differences on what kind of a country America really aspires to be. Is it going to be a truly civic nationalist country? and privileged human rights over states' rights and integrate more fully 
so that you have popular elections rather than state-based elections with 50 different electoral systems. In a sense, the United States is struggling with the same questions that the diversity of the continent of Africa is. We, America has 50 states and the South Africa and, 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 and this continent has 50 plus um, sovereign states. <clears throat> what, what I thought the AU represented was an effort to try to find common ground so that you could integrate. And that requires more of a commitment to the principles of liberal democracy and consensus building than it does ethnic nationalism. You celebrate the ethnic diversity, but over, overall can establish a framework. I think a partner in America that was committed to advancing liberal democracy based on majority rule with minority protections would be a lot better partner for Africa in the long term in keeping with the aspirations that Africa has to integrate. We know how difficult that will be because you've got a continent full of ethnic nationalists. This is the most fragmented ethnically continent in the world. I always laugh about the Chinese Hans coming in here. They can sub they can suppress their Uyghurs and their Muslims because there's a small proportion of their population and they do so brutally, brutally. But Africans have to figure out a way to get along with one another, which is what the African Union and the regional economic communities are struggling to do. If you had an America that was led by a committed civic nationalist, I mean, I mean the parallels between Cyril Ramaphosa's approach to national unity and showing some empathy for diversity and for diverse interests. Um, uh, uh, Biden couldn't talk in 11 languages, but you know, this is South Africa and that's America, but he can certainly show empathy. And Trump has none of that. The contrasts are so stark that we may have reached a, a tipping point. And, and I think that requires some fresh and creative thinking about how Africa would relate to a country that was committed to civic nationalism in a way unlike the world and Americans have, have ever confronted. They still have a long way to go to perfect that union, obviously, but I think we're at a tipping point. And that means that while Gilbert is right about PEPFAR and the uh, GOA and the, and the continuing on of those programs, we're talking about something much more fundamental here about the nature of how you aggregate human communities uh, to fight climate change, to prepare for the next pandemic, which, which afflicts people. Everybody's vulnerable to the pandemic, but it afflicts certain kinds of people different ways. And those, those penalties that people pay shouldn't be paid on the basis of their ethnic identity or their racial identity. They should be, they should be treated fairly and justly. We haven't even, I don't think we've mentioned once inequality which is at the heart of all of this stuff. So sovereign equality is a joke. Human equality is fundamental. It's an article of faith. It's an unproven proposition. So what America is debating right now is the difference between states' rights and human rights. Uh, but with states' rights reinforced by racism. That's, that's the history of America. And, and, and it's a turning point. And that could impact on Africa because who's at, who's at the issue here? It's black people. <laughs> and white people, which is different than, than, than Kikuyus and Luos, but only slightly, because is, is blood thicker than water? I don't think so. Well, my wife's saying I'm, I'm, I'm getting coached here that I'm too strident for you guys. But I'm passionate about this stuff, and I think we are. No, 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 I think, no, thanks, John. This is the, this is the essence of debate, that... Um, the elections uh, of this nature are, uh, you know, conflict broad, not conflict in terms of war <laughs> directly, but uh, there's a difference of opinion and we express those. Um, in fact, now I'd like to just bring back Gilbert um, on the same questions, uh, on the same issues. Uh, what would be your perspective, Gilbert? I think, Bob, uh, there is an exaggeration uh, that uh, the Trump has been having shouting matches with African presidents. And I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, there are a lot of episodes uh, in, in Trump's engagement with Africa. He's been, uh, during COVID-19, he, uh, he called a couple of African leaders, including Rwanda, South Africa, 
Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> there, there, have been, there have not been many African leaders going to the White House uh, under Trump, but, but as somebody said, uh, uh, senior officials from the United States have been to Africa. Uh, my point is that I don't think we want to peg U.S.-Africa relations around what I'm calling the big man syndrome here. The, the, man, the big man visited uh, Ghana, so that is a, an epitome of a functional relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm saying these things are, are, are good, but in the long run, they ultimately do not matter in the kind of substance we are talking about here. So I would not push, I put too much uh, emphasis on the issues around uh, Trump uh, uh, having problems with uh, uh, African leaders. I, 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 the, the bigger issue is that um, there is a functional relationship. I think when you have a president who is not engaged too much with an issue, it gives other people room actually to, in fact, to be, to be more innovative. And that's why I was talking about probably the issues around the bureaucratic innovation uh, of, uh, of other senior officials or embassies to, to step in where uh, Trump is not as engaged. John is making a fundamental issue, which is, I think what we should be focused upon is the application of US responsibility at the multilateral level. Uh, and the threat to me, therefore, is how do we get an administration that is focused on what I'm calling the return to multilateralism. And John was using the issue of WHO, which is fundamental. So the more I think we have the US leading on some of these issues, the better it has been for the global, from the, for the global community. And that is, I think, the bigger issue, in addition to what Bob, uh, 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 John, you are talking about, the issue around the, uh, multiculturalism, uh, the spirit of multiculturalism, which is a universal good, and we need it, and we need the moral leadership from the United States. I think I, think I don't disagree with you at all. The other point I want to make here is that we are often talking about U.S. foreign policy towards Africa, but we don't talk a lot about Africa policy towards the U.S. because there isn't actually something called Africa policy towards the U.S. And it speaks to the bigger question around how Africa is organized to engage not just the U.S. but China, the rest of these other actors we need an African voice. And once we have a galvanized African voice on how to engage the US, we will not be in this uh, predicament of always waiting for our man to be in the White House. I think Africa has to shape its own agenda and bring the other actors on board. Otherwise, we'll be back to the same, same issue. What is the US going to do for Africa? Why haven't we asked what we can do, in fact, for the rest of the world? So it speaks to bigger questions around African integration and African thinking about African positions around the world, including the United States. And this is, to me, is a better, a better approach to these questions uh, than the perennial worry about US elections. Okay, now, Gilbert, thanks for, 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 for that perspective, and in fact, uh, to both of you, as we go towards the end, I think we, uh, we, 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 we are reaching a point where we might want to go towards closing. But um, in your view, what will an African policy towards the U.S. look like uh, now that you are you know, kind of uh, focusing pretty much on the potential possibility of us being much more organized and having a policy was not just the US, but China and, and, and other powers. How will that, that uh, policy look like and how, will, that, how will, we, will we go about creating it? Should I take that or Gilbert yeah. or how do you want to do it? Okay. I think John start, yeah, okay. Um, maybe the place to start is with COVID um, because COVID has raised questions about leadership uh, individuals who are in charge. Um, demagogues seem to do far worse in handling COVID than do real Democrats. Uh, 
if if you can if you can um, uh, take stock of of uh, who's performed well and who's not performed well in Africa, uh, that would be um, uh, a place to begin. And what's useful about this is that you have at the at the African Union level, the African CDC, which has been featured quite prominently as a voice for clearing house of facts versus false information on, on, the, on the COVID and its relationship to WHO. Um, functional areas like climate change and pandemics may be the way to build uh, a common purpose here, but what we're trying to get clear in our minds, I think, is that an African policy from Africa would be better grounded in fact rather than big men, uh, which I agree with, with, um, with Gilbert, not that big men are important. Leadership in the case of COVID has to at the same time get people to isolate themselves and protect in public health ways while at the same time providing social cohesion. It's a very tricky game and God knows we've had this problem here in South Africa. Uh, in, in terms of doing the right things with science, but at the same time, the inequities that have been rooted in, in, um, in the legacy of apartheid make solving this, uh, this, this pandemic particularly bedeviling. Whether Kenya or Ghana or other countries do better is worth looking at, I think, in a collective way, because we're gonna have another pandemic. We're gonna have, as I say, climate change. We're going to have the reform of the multilateral institutions. How do we move beyond sovereign-based international order into a more human rights-based rights international order? That's what's at the heart of the African Union's uh, difference from the OAU, I think. Um, but it's a very early stage in that. And if you want to reinforce it, you need to have some practical returns on issues that matter to people. And health, public health care Last year. Are we losing John? I think internet issues there. Uh, but, but I think we right. no, he's back. You're back. Okay. Yeah, continue, John. No, no, I'm, I'm, I think I've been speaking too much, and my my uh, my coach here was just telling me that I was sounding too strident and and passionate, I should calm down. So I, I think I better defer. Uh, yeah, I think we've gotten the point you are driving. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I, I think, you know, I think particularly we take the point that uh, COVID-19 provides um, a clear opportunity for Africa to develop policy that is outward. Uh, but uh, Gilbert might want to weigh in also on the same question. Yeah. I, uh... I believe that we cannot have an Africa policy towards the US or towards China if we don't start from the basics, which is an, an integrated Africa. And John is correct that as long as we hide into the cocoons of sovereignty, uh, we are not going to have a, a policy towards the rest of the world. So the, the simple answer, Bob, is we should go back to the basics. We need to rebuild an integrated Africa. They all dream about Pan-Africanism, but in a very more realistic uh, manner. Uh, and let me just point, for instance, the continental free trade area, for instance, something that has been uh, put uh, on the African agenda. Uh, and if we have more of these platforms that we can effectively galvanize around, then we are going to begin to talk about the language of integration. But we already see countries like Kenya are negotiating bilateral agreements with the United States. Uh, that means Kenyans don't fundamentally actually believe in the continental free trade area because they want to negotiate, they want to bargain separately. Uh, with the United States, and they are in trouble with even their regional actors in East Africa who are saying, how can you have a different approach towards the United States? So it's a work in progress uh, that we need to be an integrated continent. We should work at it. Uh, we should not give up 
And I don't like that defeatist approach that we can never really uh, have an integrated Africa. So the, the simple question, the simple answer is that we are not going to have a, a policy towards the US uh, if we are not one. Uh, because otherwise we are wasting our time. But we should in fact move gradually through our sub-regional institutions, the East African communities, the SADACs, to begin to be the ECOWAS, to begin to build an infrastructure for an integrated Africa. And then we can go and listen to the Chinese. We can talk to the Americans about Africa. Now we can't. And I think this is the problem we we need to overcome. One, one quick question, one quick point, uh, Bob, and that is, um, and Gilbert, is that vaccine nationalism and this vaccine availability for Africans in a fair and equitable way provides a target of opportunity for collective voice on a very practical issue of concern to all countries. It's an example, and there will be others that will lend themselves to that kind of, a, of an appeal, which is supporting Gilbert's idea, but I think you need some practical wins. Vaccine is one of them. I agree. Sure. And um, so I think now let me, let's, let's move towards the, the closure here. And um, I'd like now to invite, but before I, before I invite you to make a closing remark, there's a question here from my colleague uh, who says a lot of these countries and the U.S. may hold leaders more accountable. How do we hold leaders more accountable in your example with Kenya? I think this is to Gilbert. You can see the yeah, question? Yeah. yeah, I can see the question, yeah. yeah. Uh, poor leadership is an important element in our countries. We, we are still uh, pretty much misgoverned. Uh, there have been international programs, there have been international pressures for democratization in Africa, but it has not removed the question around internal responsibility for our own leadership. So I think we need to do more uh, in holding our leaders accountable. We need to do more uh, to fight corruption within our own countries, rather than in fact waiting for uh, these external pressures to hold us responsible, to hold us accountable. And I like the, the discussion about Kenya, for instance. Uh, we'll still need uh, elites, elites that have uh, the nation at heart. We need elites that have uh, an investment in institutions. Not elites who wake up every morning and want to change the constitution because somebody feels aggrieved. So at, at we need, we have done very well in Africa on governance, but we have to wake up every morning to say, we need to do more uh, because of corruption and lack of accountability are problems that we know how to resolve. And nobody should be telling us how to build clean institutions. But we are not going to build clean institutions unless we have an educated population that is going to force our leaders to behave like good men and good women. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gilbert. I think those are less controversial points than earlier ones, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> But uh, let's come back to John. <laughs> and as we go towards the end, uh, in fact, this will be closing remarks. Uh, today's topic, uh, today's theme is um, was or is the meaning of the 2020 elections for US policy towards Africa and African policies towards, um, towards the US. Uh, and I think you've um, you know, laid out uh, your opening remarks and we are gonna listen much more uh, you know, to, to other perspectives. But I'll invite you to perhaps make your closing remarks on the topic um, in a nutshell from the discussions. John, we'll start with John, yeah. Yeah, there's really very little to add. Uh, the 2020 election in its essence really is between uh, a vision of America as a white predominant country 
an ethnic nationalist country versus a civic nationalist inclusive country, a country that belongs to all who live there. And I think that's of great interest to Africans because Africa is seized with this question of integration. And I think if you get a Biden administration, particularly if the Senate is, uh, is, is in democratic hands for a while, there will be opportunities to experiment for all the constraints and Africans agency ought to be alive to that just to take advantage of it because it's in the Africans best interest to have the United States, China, Europe, everyone else interested in cooperating with Africa. And under, under the last three and a half years, that has been missing. It's, it's, uh, it's worse than benign neglect. It's been malignant neglect uh, because it, when Trump does talk about Africa, he tends to talk about white farmers down here in South Africa, for heaven's sakes. So this has been an anomalous period in the United States, but it has forced the hand of the country to confront its history in ways that I think are of interest to Africa. So let's watch this election with real interest and hopefully the historical discussion next week and the functional topics that will follow will give the, your participants a sense of what Africa's stakes are in this election. Thanks, John. Indeed, uh, the sessions that follow will cover so much ground. You do not want to miss those. Um, everything from uh, defense uh, to issues to do with peace and security to economics, history, and so forth. Uh, but for now, I think I'll turn it over to Gilbert to also weigh in you with your um, closing remarks. Uh, I know that you said earlier that, uh, you know, Africans should not put too much premium on who gets into State House uh, or is it White House? But uh, let's listen to your final remarks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the spirit of, uh, of these sessions is uh, to actually have a good discussion, a good debate to argue and agree and disagree on the meaning of the US for Africa or the meaning of US elections for Africa. So I think that today we've accomplished, uh, I think the objective of setting up the debate between me and John on what does it, uh, uh, what does the US, what do US elections mean? So I want to reiterate the fact that US elections are important because every time I think we see those big debates, we appreciate the power of uh, contestation. Every time we hear uh, people shouting at each other and not killing each other, I think that allows us, especially in Africa where we tend to contest uh, violently, we do appreciate the fact that in fact there is a learning, there's a socialization component to US elections. And it's important therefore for Africa to follow what happens within the US political play, the space. And we still do appreciate the fact that, uh, I mean, countries like India, one of the biggest democracies in the world, but we don't really hear much about Indian elections as we do American elections. So I think anytime we have American elections, especially every four years, it's a good opportunity for us to learn. Having said that, as I said, I want to reiterate that the US is important to Africa, but in a, in a sense in which there are some core policies that have been with us, and I don't think they are going to go away. So I think we should celebrate that in fact, there's contestation, there's competition, but ultimately we need to step back and say, do these elections fundamentally change the very nature of US-Africa relations? I think that to me is a key element. Do they change? Do they just do it symbolically on the Obama kind of approach or do they do it substantively? But we need to work around the substance, as I said, as we build our own African capacity to engage with the rest of the world. That means doing more to work together in order to face the outside world with confidence. I think those are my closing remarks. Bob, can I just add that we should have a rematch a year from now, maybe? Can we do yes. that? See yes. what's happening? We'll yes. meet here in, uh, on virtual for, for a discussion of the impact of the U.S. election in, uh, in the summer of, or no, in, in August of uh, 2021. Good. Good. Good.
do that. Uh, this sounds like really a way the happenings in DRC a couple of years back. <laughs> and uh, we couldn't have gotten better speakers in the, you know, the, the eminent the scholars, John and Gilbert, to set us off because really you have uh, laid out the ground in its very broad terms of um, the, the, the elections and um, implications for Africa. Um, I think in closing, I would just like to point out that we're going to have these sessions every single Friday, same time. There is a suggestion that we might vary the dates, but that is subject to discussion. For now, I think we settled on Friday. Uh, Friday, same time. Uh, in the next session, we are going to have a very seasoned uh, political analyst, Francis Konige and uh, Brooke Spector, discussing the historical and constitutional issues. Uh, and, and, and I think this, um, uh, the, we're going to start circulating uh, uh, the, and publicizing that event already uh, beginning this weekend, in fact. And so you do not want to miss that. And uh, as you go down, uh, you know, up to 27th November this year, we'll be touching on uh, matters to do with the party politics, Republican versus Democratic Party, assessment of candidates, in fact, you know, where we'll go into a more focused discussion of Biden and Trump, you know, Africa, the U.S., and the geopolitics thereof, including China, which we just really touched on in passing. Uh, we're going to talk Africa-U.S. military relations, issues of, de of democracy and human rights, race relations and diaspora issues, uh, and implication, in fact, for the various regions of the continent, uh, you know, so that uh, perhaps uh, West Africa engages with the U.S. in a slightly different way from Horn of Africa, for example, and, and those will be the subject to discussion. But thanks for making time, and until next Friday, we hope to... I'll uh, see you again. Thank you.